I'm very excited to have the opportunity to speak with you all tonight about the most common heart condition that we see here at the University of Minnesota, and that's specifically degenerative mitral valve disease, or DMVD, as I'll be referring to it throughout the rest of this presentation. Specifically, we're gonna talk about how we diagnose DMVD and what you can expect if your dog is diagnosed with DMVD. And then later on in the talk, we'll be sure to highlight some of the treatment options that we have for this condition, and even some of the more novel surgical techniques that we are trying here to help dogs with DMVD at the University of Minnesota. I'll first talk um, a little bit about why DMVD is so important. Like I mentioned, DMVD is the most common heart disease that we see in dogs. And one in 10 dogs seen by veterinarians has heart disease. And of those dogs, about 75% of them have DMVD. Here at the University of Minnesota's cardiology service, we see about five to seven cases of DMVD every single day. We do know that DMVD is more common in certain breeds. The one that you'll see most often is Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, but we also know that it's quite common in other breeds as well, including Dachshunds, miniature and toy poodles, and really any small breed dog, especially those dogs that are under 40 pounds. DMVD also becomes more common as dogs get older, and some studies suggest that up to 85% of small breed dogs will actually develop DMVD by the time they're 13. So now that we've discussed why DMVD is so important, let's take a step back and actually talk about what DMVD is. So DMVD is a disease of the heart valves, Specifically, the mitral valve is the most common valve affected, and that's the valve shown here on the right-hand side of the slide that separates the left-sided heart chambers from each other and is denoted by this pencil in the drawing. If we zoom in on that mitral valve and look at it at a microscopic level, we'll see that the valve itself is made up of several layers. There's an atrial layer, a spongiosa layer, and a fibrous layer. And when dogs develop degenerative mitral valve disease, their mitral valve becomes thicker because they develop more of that spongiosa layer tissue. And because that layer's primary job is to absorb shock as the valve moves, this thickening actually ends up making the valve weaker overall. And what happens when our valve becomes weaker is that every time that valve closes, a little bit of blood leaks back through that valve as regurgitation. And that regurgitation or leakiness is what we hear when we listen to your dog's chest with our stethoscope as a heart murmur. Let's take even another step back and see why that leakiness or regurgitation matters in the long run and what you can expect if your dog does have DMVD. So again, separating the heart, um, we can think about the heart as having two different sides. There's a right side of the heart and a left side of the heart. The mitral valve specifically lives where that star just appeared on your screen on the left side of the heart, between the two chambers on that side of the heart. So if we follow the path of blood through the heart, we can see what happens when that mitral valve is leaky. Let's start with blood that's returning to the heart from the body. That blood is gonna enter into the right atrium. It's gonna pass through a valve known as the tricuspid valve and enter into the right ventricle. Then the heart's gonna pump and it's gonna squeeze that blood out into the lungs where it picks up oxygen and then circles back to the left side of the heart. The blood will enter the left atrium and travel to the left ventricle through the mitral valve. And then the heart will pump again and pump that blood out forward to the body. When that mitral valve becomes leaky, which again is this structure right here between the left atrium and left ventricle, 
we start to see blood flowing backwards every time that the heart beats into that left atrial chamber instead of all of it going out into the aorta into the body. And so what does happen in dogs with DMVD as it progresses is that left atrium, because it's seeing all that extra blood, is going to become enlarged. And when that left atrium can no longer accommodate all that extra blood, that is when we unfortunately start to see blood and fluid back up into the lungs. And that is what we are referring to when we talk about congestive heart failure. So I know that congestive heart failure, of course, sounds scary, but I do want to give you guys some good news and some hope. And that is that in general, we can diagnose DMVD prior to the onset of congestive heart failure. And the absolute best way to do this is to see your veterinarian for your pet's annual wellness checkups. At those appointments, they're going to listen really carefully to your dog's heart, and they're going to let you know if your dog has developed a heart murmur as your dog gets older. <clears throat> the next thing that your veterinarian is likely to recommend after they hear that heart murmur is going to be evaluating a set of chest x-rays on your dog. And that will allow them to both look at your dog's heart on x-rays, but also to look at your dog's lungs and make sure there's no evidence of that congestive heart failure or fluid back up into the lungs. The next thing that your veterinarian is likely going to do is refer you to a cardiologist, and that's so that you can get a test done known as an echocardiogram. So, if your veterinarian hears a new heart murmur in your dog, why and when should you consider referral to a cardiologist? The main reason to see a cardiologist, at least initially with your pet, is so that your dog can have an echocardiogram performed. An echocardiogram is just a really fancy way of saying a cardiac ultrasound, so an ultrasound of your dog's heart, and that's gonna let us look really closely at how your dog's heart is functioning. There's a lot of information that we can get on an echocardiogram, but, but specifically what we're going to be doing in dogs with new heart murmurs is confirming if DMVD is present, staging the DMVD if it's present, which we'll talk about um, pretty extensively here later in this talk. We'll also determine if there's any appropriate medical or surgical treatment that's recommended for your dog. And we'll be able to give you a better sense of what your dog's prognosis is if they have DMVD using their echocardiogram. So how exactly do we confirm a diagnosis of DMVD on echocardiogram? Specifically, what we're doing is we're looking very closely at your dog's mitral valve on our echocardiogram. And that's shown here on the top right-hand side of the screen. If you look here, you'll see that um, there's an arrow labeled MV pointing out, your, out the mitral valve. And what we're looking for in patients with DMVD is any thickening of this valve, which you can see depicted in this picture here. Normally this valve is a nice thin line and this valve is quite thickened. We're also gonna look for any evidence of prolapse of the mitral valve, which you can see here on the bottom right-hand side of the screen in the figure labeled A. In dogs with DMVD, every time the mitral valve closes, it actually starts to buckle up abnormally into this left atrium, which you can see pointed out here with this arrow, and that's called mitral valve prolapse. It's a hallmark feature of this condition. And then lastly, what we can look for is any evidence of regurgitation, which is shown in the figure B here at the bottom right-hand side of the screen. And that is directly depicting that leakiness of the valve every time that it's closing. In addition to confirming whether or not DMVD is present, the next thing that we're going to do is actually assess the severity of the DMVD. And the main ways that we do that are by looking at the size of the left atrium and the left ventricle. If they're enlarged, that suggests that the disease is more progressed. We're also going to look for some things that we can see secondary to DMVD specifically evidence of pulmonary hypertension or high blood pressure in the lungs, evidence of congestive heart failure, which we mentioned earlier, and then evidence of involvement of any of the other heart valves, because we do know that DMVD can affect any of the valves in the heart. 
<clears throat> After we've confirmed a diagnosis of DMVD, the next important step that we must do is provide staging information for <clears throat> the patient. In dogs with DMVD, we stage them as stage A, stage B, stage C, or stage D. And the reason that we do that is because dogs are treated differently depending on what stage they're at. And as you can probably imagine, a dog's prognosis is also going to be different depending on what stage of the disease they have. Dogs with stage A disease are <laughs> dogs who actually don't even have DMVD, but are dogs that are considered at risk for developing DMVD. So these dogs are not going to have a heart murmur when we listen to them. They're going to have a normal echocardiogram and they're going to include breeds of dogs that are at risk for developing DMVD. And those breeds include Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, Dachshunds, Poodles, and small breed dogs in general. Stage A does not require any treatment at all, not even supplements or anything like that. And the best thing to do at stage A is to just continue to have annual evaluations by your primary veterinarian so that they can listen really closely to your dog's heart for any evidence of a heart murmur. Moving on now to stage B, these dogs do have evidence of DMVD, but importantly, these dogs do not have evidence of congestive heart failure. This is typically the stage that we're diagnosing dogs who have DMVD with. Dogs with stage B DMVD are going to have a heart murmur when we listen to them, so that's the first way that we can detect this stage. When we perform an echocardiogram on these dogs, they are gonna have those changes to the mitral valve that we mentioned earlier in the talk. At this stage, a lot of times we'll recommend additional testing just depending on what's going on with your dog, including chest x-rays, which we mentioned previously. We'll wanna check your dog's blood pressure. We'll recommend an echocardiogram so that we can get a close look at your dog's heart and mitral valve. And then we may or may not recommend other tests like an EKG to look at your dog's heart rhythm or even blood tests, which one that you may have heard of is NT ProBNP. It's one of the cardiac enzymes that we can look at to see if there's any evidence of heart disease on a blood test. In stage B, there are a couple of different sub-stages, which we'll talk about here in a second, but treatment does vary depending on what sub-stage you have. Specifically, when we sub-stage dogs who have stage B, which I know now we're getting in the weeds, but I think it's important to fully understand the condition, we can sub-stage them into stage B1 or stage B2. Dogs who have stage B1 disease are going to have DMVT, they're going to have a murmur, but when we look at their heart on echocardiogram or on x-rays, their heart is going to be normal in size. And this is really important because at this stage, if they otherwise have a normal heart, there's no reason to believe that any treatment at this time would be beneficial, which is different than stage B2. You can consider mildly restricting sodium in your dog's diet. Usually we'll start by restricting the amount of salt in the treats that we give our dogs because those tend to be the culprits when it comes to high sodium intake. We'll typically recommend that these dogs have a reassessment with an echocardiogram every six to 12 months, just so that we can pick up on progression when and if it does happen. And then at this time, we're likely going to recommend that you start doing something called monitoring your dog's resting respiratory rate. And that's just a really fancy way of saying that we want you to keep a close eye on monitoring your dog's breathing at home. Because if your dog develops um, congestive heart failure, their breathing rates are going to become elevated from what they normally are. And the most accurate and best time to measure a dog's breathing rate is when they're resting or better yet, fully sleeping. Because as you guys can probably imagine, dogs when they're awake get really excited and then they start panting and those breathing rates are not reliable. 
What I've included up here in the upper right hand um, corner of the slide is a QR code for a free phone application that uh, is a nice tool to monitor your dog's resting respiratory rate at home, and it allows you to keep track of that data over time. So it's helpful for people who are doing this regularly and who are like me and for forgetful to actually record that information so that you can reference it later on. <clears throat> Dogs with stage B2 heart disease will have DMVD and they will have heart enlargement secondary to the, your, that DMVD. So you'll see on these echocardiographic images here on the right hand side of the slide, this dog's left atrium is enlarged here and his left ventricle is enlarged as well. These dogs do have recommended treatment strategies, which we'll talk about here next. In these dogs, we'll often also recommend mild sodium restriction while still focusing on making sure your dog's getting adequate protein and nutrients. We'll also recommend a recheck echocardiogram every 6 to 12 months, and we'll also mo recommend monitoring of those breathing rates at home. Stage C DMVD includes dogs who have developed congestive heart failure secondary to their DMVD. These dogs are going to have signs associated with heart failure, which typically include breathing changes at home, but can include anything from decreased energy level to coughing, etc. These dogs absolutely need treatment in order to survive. And these dogs will also be recommended to cut down on their dietary sodium intake. <clears throat> and we may or may not recommend some supplements at this stage as well. These dogs will need routine blood work and x-ray monitoring throughout the rest of their lives. And many times these dogs will have some degree of exercise restriction, typically allowing them to exercise as they're tolerating at home and not pushing them too hard. And then we'll also monitor their breathing rates. On this slide, uh, what I have shown here is just an x-ray image that's showing a really, really white coloration to this dog's lungs. And that's consistent with fluid in the lungs or congestive heart failure. Lastly, we have stage D, and these are dogs who have congestive heart failure that are refractory to the standard treatments that we use for congestive heart failure. These dogs will need aggressive treatment in order to survive. They'll also need frequent blood work and x-ray monitoring, and they'll also have similar uh, breathing rate and exercise restrictions as well. So let's now delve into one of the more exciting things to discuss when we're talking about DMVD, and that's treatment. So how do we treat dogs who have DMVD based on their stage? Dogs who have stage A DMVD do not need any treatments at all. And that's the same as dogs who have stage B1 DMVD. It's not until we get to stage B2 that we start recommending treatment for these patients. In stage B2, every dog that's reached this stage of the disease will be prescribed a medication called Pemobendin or the brand name that's most common is Vetmedin. So I've shown that here at the bottom right-hand side of the slide. If you've had the pleasure of having to give this medication to your dog, you'll recommend you'll recognize this large tablet um, that can be a challenge to entice your dogs to um, take the medication for sure. We recommend Pemobendin at this stage because there have been large studies that have shown pretty conclusively that if we start that medication at this stage, we will prolong the time until a dog develops congestive heart failure from this condition. The other medications that we may recommend at this stage on an individual basis include medications such as angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, or ACE inhibitors. These are used commonly in humans with heart disease, and these include medications that you may recognize, such as enalapril, benazapril. There are a few others as well. We also may prescribe your dog a cough suppressant at this stage if they're having cough associated with the size of their heart pressing on their airways. 
If they're having cough signs that are more consistent with heart failure, then we'll recommend other treatments instead. In stage C, DMVD, we often need to hospitalize these patients at least initially in order to provide them more aggressive care while we get their condition under control. And hospitalization allows us to do a couple of things that are helpful at this stage. Mainly, it allows us to give your dog supplemental oxygen therapy. There are a number of ways that we can and do give your dog supplemental oxygen that are beyond the scope of this talk, but that are options here um, at the University of Minnesota. It also allows us to give injectable medications, specifically diuretics, because those are the medications that directly pull that fluid out from the lungs when we have congestive heart failure. Those medications, the most common one that you'll see us prescribe is a medication called furosemide. It has a couple of brand names. You may recognize the name Lasix or Salix. It's all the same thing. We, we have to be confusing and, and give things multiple names because of course we do. We can also make your pet more comfortable by giving them mild sedating medications because anytime that they're having difficulty breathing, it will cause them to have some degree of anxiety as well. Once patients are stabilized and no longer need those aggressive care options, they'll be receiving several medications when they are at home. So the standard medications that a dog will be on if they have stage C DMVD at home include furosemide, which is a diuretic, hemobendin, which we talked about in stage B2. At this stage, all dogs are recommended to have angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ACE inhibitors, and all dogs are recommended to have spironolactone at this stage too, which is another diuretic. Sorry, I keep <clears throat> going backwards here. Stage D. Um, stage D patients will also occasionally need hospitalization for treatment, the options being similar between stage D and C. And then stage D patients, they often need much more aggressive at-home treatments. Our options for this include more aggressive types of diuretics. So you may be familiar with diuretics such as torsamide or hydrochlorothiazide. Oftentimes at this stage, this is when we'll increase your dog's pemobendin dose. And if your dog has developed any signs of high blood pressure, they may be started on an antihypertensive medication as well, such as amlodipine or hydralazine. If your dog has severe pulmonary hypertension secondary to, secondary to their heart disease, we may prescribe them sildenafil at this stage. And then at this stage, dogs are at higher risk for arrhythmias or abnormal heartbeats, which may require treatment. And then typically we continue the ACE inhibitor and spironolactone therapy at this stage as well. This stage admittedly is quite complicated to manage and it is best to have your dog be under the guidance of a veterinary cardiologist if they do reach this stage of the disease. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the surgical treatment options for DMVD. So before this, we've been focusing exclusively on the medical therapies that we have to help dogs who have DMVD. But more and more surgical options are becoming available for this condition. And in humans that have DMVD, surgery is the gold standard treatment for this condition. When we discuss surgical options for DMVD, there really are two main types or categories of surgeries that can be considered for this condition. The first type is open heart surgery. So as you can imagine, this type is a aggressive and invasive type of surgery. <clears throat> this type of surgery involves um, placing your pet on cardiopulmonary bypass, so a heart and lung machine, while the heart is stopped for the duration of the surgery. Open heart surgery is typically going to include repair of the mitral valve. There are some replacement or prosthetic valve options, but they're typically not suitable for canine patients, and so they're not performed in the majority of instances. Unfortunately, as some of you may know, 
this option of open heart surgery is very limited. And currently there aren't any veterinary institutions in the United States that are regularly performing this type of surgery. And that includes us here at the University of Minnesota. This is currently not an option here. So let's now segue into talking about the other main type of surgery that we have for this condition. And those are our less invasive catheter-based surgery options. The one that you will hear about and the one that is being performed most commonly nowadays is called transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair or TIER. This is a less invasive option that can be performed beating heart, meaning that we don't need to use cardiopulmonary bypass. It involves placing a small device across the mitral valve called a V-clamp, which is similar if you've heard of the mitral clip in humans. It's very a very similar concept. The clamp is placed across the mitral valve to try to bring the valve leaflets together and allow them to be stronger. And so what you'll see here um, on this slide is a cartoon depiction of this device. So up here, you can see in figure A, the device before it's placed across the mitral valve. And then we'll go over a few pictures and, and videos here in the rest of the talk about some of the procedures that we've done here. But this just depicts essentially how the device is placed across the valve and then clamped together in order to bring these leaflets closer to each other and overall, by doing that, that's going to reduce the amount of leakiness of this valve. So let's delve into that a little bit further, shall we? <clears throat> we have started performing this procedure here at the University of Minnesota. These are my favorite slides because you get to see our adorable and wonderful patients. Here at Minnesota, we've done this procedure in a total of three dogs. So this is a very new procedure that we are trying here. All three of the dogs that we performed this procedure in um, up until this point have all had DMVD stage B2. So if you'll think back, those are the dogs who haven't developed congestive heart failure yet, but who are at risk for developing it because their hearts are dilated from their DMVD. All three of the dogs that we performed this procedure on recovered very well from the procedure and were able to go home to their families within 48 hours of the surgery. All three of the patients had a significant reduction in the regurgitation or leakiness of their mitral valve. And amazingly, two out of three of them actually had normalization of the left side of their heart. And the third one had improvement of the left side of their heart, although it didn't measure normal. These were all done uh, within the last couple of months, and so I don't unfortunately have any long-term data on these patients to provide you guys with, but we will certainly be uh, monitoring these guys moving forward so that we can see if this is a procedure that's going to be of benefit to patients with DMVD. Let's talk a little bit more about um, what this procedure looks like um, because it is newer and it's something that maybe not everybody is familiar with. So the first thing that we do when we are performing this uh, TEER procedure or TEAR procedure is something called a transesophageal echocardiogram or TEE. This is a very specialized form of echocardiography. It's different than what you your dog will have if they're going to a cardiologist routinely. And it does require anesthesia to be able to perform this type of testing. But this type of echocardiography allows us to get a very, very specific look at your dog's mitral valve and determine whether or not they're a good candidate for the TIER procedure. Using transesophageal echo, we are also able to really closely measure the dog's mitral valve and pick the best possible device or V-clamp to put in their valve to help them. So you can see on this slide, it keeps looping over and over, a video of us performing TEE on one of our TR patients here 
and we are looking at a 3D image across the mitral valve here and assessing um, whether or not this patient would be a good candidate for the procedure. And spoiler alert, this one was a good candidate. Next is the actual procedure itself, so the surgery. The surgery is an open chest surgery, so it's not an open heart surgery, but we do have to make a small incision into the side of the chest. This is different than some of the bigger um, open chest surgeries that you may have heard of or that you may have seen done in humans where they cut through the sternum, um, but it still is a, a, an incision into the chest, so um, something that we have to monitor very closely postoperatively. This is a beating heart procedure, so there's no um, cardiopulmonary bypass for these patients. What we do once we've accessed the chest is uh, place a small catheter directly into the heart through the left ventricle. And to do this, we use our TEE and fluoroscopic or live action X-ray um, in order to assess where we're at with our catheter. And then once we've confirmed appropriate placement of the catheter, that's when we will place the device through the catheter and deploy it. <clears throat> so here on this uh, video here, you can see us looking at the device. It's in the middle of the valve here, making a little T shape. You can see that across the mitral valve, we're confirming that we're in a good location before we deploy the device. And then skipping over here, um, on the more left-hand side of the screen, this is fluoroscopy or x-ray imaging where we're looking at the device on x-ray inside the heart. So both of those are really important because positioning is essential in this procedure in order to achieve successful and desired outcomes. After we've deployed the first clamp, that's when we'll reassess and determine whether or not any additional clamps are needed. So far in our three patients, two out of three of those patients have needed additional clamps. The next image that popped up on the screen here is just an image showing the device before it was um, fully deployed. And you can see it's still attached to that catheter that's going through the heart. Once we've confirmed placement, that's when we'll deploy the catheter with, or deploy the device, which you can see on the left-hand side of the screen. And now you can see that the catheter is gone. The device is um, much smaller because it's now clamping those mitral valve leaflets together. So I think those are some neat images from our surgeries. The last part of the procedure is just the post-operative care. So these patients do need to be hospitalized post-operatively. They will have post-operative transthoracic echocardiograms done, which are the standard echocardiograms that you guys are all used to being done um, if you've seen them performed in, in dogs or humans before. Postoperatively, we're typically um, hospitalizing these guys in our intensive care unit for about 24 to 48 hours so that we can monitor how they recover from anesthesia. And then roughly 24 hours after the surgery is when they'll have their postoperative echocardiogram performed in order to determine success of the procedure. My favorite slide in the whole presentation and the most important thing of all is that all three of our patients that have undergone this procedure thus far here at the university have all gone home to their very loving families and you can see how happy they are all to go to be reunited with their families here postoperatively. These are all taken from within 48 hours of the surgery. So pretty amazing turnaround time. I'm not sure humans could recover this quickly, to be honest. The last thing that I wanted to touch on before we have time for some questions um, is the prognosis with DMVD. So the prognostic information that I'm going to share with you guys here are from primarily from dogs who've had medical management, just because that's what's done in the vast, vast majority of cases currently, although hopefully not in the future. And so prognosis with stage A is considered excellent. And so long as the dogs never develop a heart murmur, their prognosis remains excellent. Prognosis in stage B1 is considered good. And once a dog's um, progressed to stage B2, 
that's when we typically see on average dogs go about two and a half years with that pemobendin or vet medin medication um, being taken daily before they progress to stage C and develop congestive heart failure. If they're not started on pemobendin, it will progress faster than that two and a half years time. Once dogs have developed congestive heart failure and reached stage C, that's when we're typically able to manage them with a good quality of life for about 12 to 18 months before their quality of life can be expected to be impacted. Stage D has a more guarded prognosis than the rest of the stages and it really depends on the individual patient. So just to summarize, um, DMVD, it's the most common cause of a heart murmur in dogs, especially as they get older. It's common in any small breed dog, but not exclusive to small breed dogs. Large breed dogs can certainly get this condition as well. Screening primarily is going to involve um, annual auscultation by your veterinarian at your dog's wellness checkups. And diagnosis and staging is going to require an echocardiogram, so assessment by a cardiologist. In general, we have two avenues for treatment, medical treatment options, which we discussed and are recommended starting as soon as stage B2, and then surgical treatment options, which include the new option that we're offering here at the University of Minnesota, and that's that TEER procedure using the V-clamp. <clears throat> I certainly want to take some time to answer questions because I know we've received a lot of really good questions already, which I'm very appreciative of. I do want to point out on this question slide here, anyone who is interested or anyone who's veterinarian thinks your pet may be a good candidate for this procedure is welcome to email our cardiology team here. And I just ask to simplify things and make sure that we get back to you as quickly as possible, that you just put this in your subject line, tear procedure, and then your pet's name. We'll still see it if you don't, but that just helps us streamline things a little bit. Um, and that will allow us to see if your dog may be a candidate for the procedure. Um, and likely, if we think that they may be, we'll recommend an initial assessment with our team at that time. So without further ado, I will um, throw it back to Scott and Lauren to see what questions we had from the team. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Masters. Very wonderful presentation. We have a lot of questions. They were received beforehand and a lot were rolling in tonight. So if you are ready, we can jump right in. Absolutely. Yes. Perfect. So you talked a lot about the different breeds that are more susceptible to mitral valve disease, um, but one of the questions is, does age affect the treatment options in the animals? Yeah, that's a great question. So age in general and as an isolated factor does not affect treatment options for DMVD. Age is going to affect the likelihood of a dog having other diseases that can make managing heart disease more challenging, specifically kidney disease, which is pretty common in dogs as they get older. And then when we're referencing our surgical options, there's not necessarily an impact on age for surgical options, but we do know that as dogs get older, they're more high-risk anesthetic candidates. So it's just something to really carefully consider on an individual basis, whether or not it's safe to perform anesthesia in your dog, which can depend on age. Although I will say that the oldest patient that we have done that tear procedure on so far was 15. Wow. Um, she did have a couple of um, things pop up with anesthesia that we had to manage postoperatively, but she's otherwise doing well. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, so kind of playing off that a little bit, does, this, does the disease progress more quickly in certain breeds, such as the Dachshunds, the Cavaliers, et cetera? Yes, another great question. So um, we certainly know that certain breeds are predisposed to DMVD, and we have a lot of good evidence to suggest specifically that Cavalier King Charles Spaniels are at risk for having DMVD that progresses faster than other breeds. That being said, the prognostic information that I shared a couple slides ago 
includes large studies that were done in multiple breeds that had many cavaliers represented in those populations. Um, so the prognosis that we give doesn't necessarily change based on the breed. Got it. Thank you. So no surprise, we got lots of questions on kind of medications and treatment. So I'm going to throw a couple your way, if that's okay. Um, yeah. You early on described or talked a bit about ACE inhibitors, but do you describe any ACE inhibitors for stage B1 and or stage B2? Yes, a very good question. Um, an occasionally controversial question. <laughs> uh, the easy answer is for stage B1, we never prescribe ACE inhibitors unless there's something else going on like high blood pressure. In stage B2, there's a lot of conflicting studies out there on uh, when and why to prescribe ACE inhibitors at that stage. And so here at the University of Minnesota, we use a lot of criteria from a dog's echocardiogram to assess their risk of heart failure. And if that risk is deemed to be high, we will prescribe them ACE inhibitors unless there's a reason not to. Perfect. Um, somebody asked uh, from tonight, you, you, I know the dosage of medication can vary a lot and it's a science, but is there anything better than five milligrams of vet med, vet med in? Yeah, so vet medin is typically dosed based on a dog's size. So it's hard to say that's a question that I would certainly bring up with your primary veterinarian or if you're seen here by the cardiology service to make sure that it's an appropriate dose for your dog. And then vet medin is currently the type of pemobendin that we have the most um, research on. So we often are going to prescribe that formulation unless there's a logistical reason where we can't give a dog vet medin and are giving them another type of pemobendin. There's just less information out there on other types of pemobendin, but hopefully uh, it's a relatively newer medication in general. So hopefully over time, we're going to continue to get more information on those other types of vet medin. Awesome. Thank you. You touched on um, kind of supplements earlier on. Can you talk a little bit about what supplements you recommend for, you know, dogs with mitral valve disease? Yes. Yeah, that, that's also a great question. The short answer is there's not really been any conclusive studies showing that certain supplements are absolutely necessary at different stages of DMVD. And so when we reference the consensus guidelines on treating DMVD in dogs, there's no specific supplement recommendations. That being said, there's certainly a lot of theoretical benefits to supplements, uh, mainly antioxidant supplements like fatty acids, the fish oil supplements, um, or the CoQ10, coenzyme Q10 supplements that um, are probably the most common that you'll see out there prescribed for heart disease. And so it's not uncommon for us to recommend or at least discuss those supplements with you if your dog has more advanced mitral valve disease. Got it. Thank you. Um, somebody just asked um, if you could explain a little bit more about how pimobendin works and how how or why it yeah. helps. Yes. Um, Hemobendin, in my personal opinion, is one of the coolest medications that exists in the world because it does two really beneficial things together that no other medication does by itself. And that is it increases the strength of your dog's heart beating. So it is called a positive inotrope, just meaning it's helping your heart to contract stronger and beat stronger. But it does so in a way that does not require any more energy or stress be put on the heart than, um, than normal. And that's just a really unique feature of that medication that is not true for other medications that help the heart beat stronger. And it also helps to um, alleviate any signs of high blood pressure as well, which, um, as you can imagine, if you have high blood pressure out in your body, your heart just has to work that much harder to pump blood out to, to the rest of your body. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question, kind of changing gears a little bit, but what is the role of peas or legumes in mitral valve disease? And has there been research done on those kind of items or uh, I guess beans, legumes specifically? Yeah, <laughs> yes, we have a very well-read audience. I love it. Um, yeah, the there's not been any link established between diets, including uh, peas, legumes, 
grain-free diets. There's not been any links of um, those diets to worsening mitral valve disease. That being said, we know that those diets have been associated with conditions where we can see reduced pumping function of the heart. And ultimately, it's uh, it can be come problematic if we have a dog who's on one of those diets and they develop that reduced pumping function for us to be able to manage their degenerative valve disease very well. So a little bit of a complicated answer, but um, the association between peas and legumes and reduced contractility and heart pumping function is definitely something that exists. We have no idea why. It is an active area of research, although admittedly not my particular area of research. Um, but if we're seeing that in these dogs, we'll, we'll likely recommend a diet change if they have DMVD, just so that it doesn't accelerate it or make it worse. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, we're getting a lot of questions on the, the TER tier procedure. Yeah, uh, Lauren is working great. hard behind the scenes. Um, <laughs> so if you don't Lauren. mind, if you few questions in that direction. Um, what is the success rate of the TEER surgery for dogs kind of in general? Yeah, I should have uh, touched on that more during the talk. Thank you for asking that. Um, the procedure itself is really new. So the first time this procedure was ever done in a dog was less than two years ago. And as you can imagine with a new procedure, it's hard to get lots of cases right away. And so there's actually no information published about outcomes with this surgery. Um, other veterinary institutions that are doing the procedure in the country have shared outcomes that they've seen in their small groups of dogs that they've done this in. And overall, the risk of major complications with the surgery um, like failure of the surgery or um, even, you know, unfortunately death during the surgery, those risks are very low, seemingly less than 5% of cases. But as far as following these dogs out for the long term, it's so hard to know. Um, but I guess it's promising that most of them seem to be doing really well almost two years out. So we'll we'll continue to follow them out, but it wouldn't be fair for me to give any real um, timelines based on what we know so far. So it's in the very early stages of development. Got it. Thank you. I might be pushing my luck, but if you teased out any breed specific information, such as Cavaliers, I, yeah. that came as a question too, too soon to tell. Yeah, it's a little bit too soon to tell. I can comment on the two Cavaliers that we've done the procedure on here. Um, both did really well, both tolerated the procedure quite well. One of them had normalization of his heart size with the procedure. Um, the other one still is what we would consider a stage B2 dog. Um, but even if he stays that way for years and years, that would be great because the main goal um, at that stage in performing the procedure is to prolong the time before they develop heart failure. We can do the procedure in dogs with heart failure as well. The goals just become a little bit different. Um, but yeah, hopefully that gives a, a little bit of anecdotal information. Um, uh, this procedure is absolutely being done in many Cavaliers across the country as well. So other institutions will have Cavalier data too that I'm sure eventually will be um, out there and, and more widely available. Thank you. Uh, do you know roughly a ballpark estimate for cost for the procedure? Yes. So because we've only done three procedures and it was new, the costs for the procedures at the that stage were heavily subsidized. So I don't have super accurate estimates to give you. Based on costs of similar procedures here and the cost of the device itself, I do suspect that the procedure is going to be in the realm of thirteen to $15,000 including the surgery and all of the pre- and post-operative care. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so going back a little bit to, you know, degenerative mitral valve disease, uh, if there's some questions that are coming through, um, how about cats? Are they impacted at all with mitral valve disease? Yes, we're so quick to forget about cats. Cats actually, thankfully, do not tend to get degenerative mitral valve disease very frequently. It's a very, very rare condition in cats. It does happen, but 
for whatever reason, they do not have the same predisposition, likely because of genetics, to developing this condition as dogs do. Interestingly, we see this in horses, and I'm trying to think of other cool exotic species that we see this condition in, but we, we certainly do see it in other species, just not cats. Great, thank you. Um, what is the typical or average onset of uh, DMVD? Yeah, so it depends on the um, stage that we're talking about, but in general, the average age of development of a heart murmur associated with DMVD, so not necessarily heart failure, is around age 8 to 12. Perfect. Thank you. Um, just watching the questions populate. Uh, thank you so much for, for going through all yeah. these. We very much appreciate it. And I know, I know the participants um, are excited for this portion too. So, uh, you talked about the low-sodium diet early on. So there's a question that says, are there any specific recommendations for diet that can kind of be more of a preventative or helpful for preventing um, mitral valve disease in the future? Yes. So you will see that many of the um, diet brands that have veterinary prescription diets, those are brands like Science Diet, uh, Royal Canin, Purina, they all have some form of prescription cardiac diet. They are all pretty new diets, so they're all still under investigation as far as um, how they, how much they impact prognosis when we talk about this condition. But there are some studies out there on these diets that show, especially when started early on, such as stage B2, for instance, um, that it can also help to prolong time to onset of heart failure. And so those are diets that you can even talk to your primary veterinarian about. Um, those diets, typically why they're helpful is because they are high in um, medium chain fatty acids, which the heart uses for its energy source. They're low in sodium, which we talked about, um, and they have really high quality protein ingredients because over time, as heart conditions progress, the body's demand for high quality nutrients like protein increases. Perfect. Thank you. Um... Um, how does someone who's not a vet veterinarian know if a cough is heart murmur related or um, due to maybe like a partially collapsed trachea? Yes, a question that's even hard for veterinarians to answer sometimes. So such a good question. Um, the short answer is the absolute best way to tell is have your veterinarian take a look at your dog and most likely they're going to recommend some x-rays. And that's going to let them, A, look at your dog's airways, like the trachea, and make sure there's no evidence of that collapse. And B, it's going to let them look at your dog's lungs and make sure there's no evidence of heart failure, which is what one of the things that could cause heart, cough with heart disease. The other really, really helpful thing that you can do at home to know whether or not your dog's cough is from airway disease or uh, to know at least whether it's more likely to be from airway disease versus heart disease are two things. One, you can see when the cough is happening. So if the cough is happening when your dog's getting really excited or if they have a neck leash, a neck collar, if it happens when that collar presses on their neck, that's gonna be more likely to be from collapsing trachea or, or any airway conditions. Whereas if the cough is just happening randomly, uh, no real pattern to it, that could be more consistent with a cough from heart disease. And then the last thing that is really helpful um, if you see that your dog is coughing and you're wondering if it's from heart disease or not, is to monitor those breathing rates that I mentioned earlier in the talk. So when your dog's fully sleeping, if the amount of times that their chest rises and falls in a minute's time, um, each time the chest rises and falls, that's just one breath. If they're breathing less than 35 breaths per minute, that's considered normal. And so it's if they're coughing, it's probably more likely that it's their airway than, than heart failure. Perfect. And thank you again for sharing the QR code for the resting respiratory yeah. app for your phone. It seems like a really great way to do it. I use it uh, for my own dog. <laughs> so I'm forgetful. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
If you have a dog that's diagnosed with stage B or I guess above um, mitral valve disease, are they safe to be vaccinated with kind of yearly sequences mm. and stuff? Would they be considered healthy? Yeah, that's a, another great question. In general, the answer to that question is yes. When you look at the vaccine guidelines from the um, Association of Veterinary Hospitals, they don't consider existence of degenerative mitral valve disease as a reason not to vaccinate. That being said, there are some, um, of course, nuances to that. So definitely um, work with your veterinarian, make sure that they um, don't have any concerns about your dog's health status at that exact moment. For instance, if they have signs of congestive heart failure, then certainly it's not appropriate to vaccinate them at that time until things are more controlled. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions I saw come through kind of talk about um, kind of what's on the horizon for genetic testing around mm -hmm. mitral valve mm -hmm. disease. Uh, do you have any information you can share on that? Short answer is no, but um, <laughs> there are lots and lots of genetic tests out there. There's not um, necessarily one that cardiologists have agreed on is the ideal um, genetic test for any breed. Most genetic tests do depend on your dog's breed. Um, and so there, there are a lot of tests floating around out there. We're still figuring out what to do with a lot of them, to be completely honest. I hope in my lifetime that we'll um, have that better figured out. But I know that that segues into um, gene therapies and things like that that are certainly an active area of research for DMVD specifically. Um, and that's admittedly not my area of research, but also something that I'm certainly looking out for and excited to um, see where where that goes in our lifetimes as well. Perfect. I, I think we got time for probably one more question. And I want to go back to um, the, the procedure TEER. Um, what is involved in kind of the candidacy process or what makes an, a dog a good candidate for the procedure and what would maybe rule somebody out as people are kind of thinking about this and maybe sharing um, an email with your service? Yeah, so it's um, a relatively complicated question. So certainly if you're reaching out, we'll give you lots of information, but really two things to keep in mind. The First is going to be the goal of doing the procedure in your dog, and that's going to depend on your dog's stage of DMVD. Right now, we're focusing a lot on stage B2 dogs because our goal is to prolong the time till they develop heart failure. But that being said, just because your dog's had an episode of heart failure doesn't mean they're not a candidate. It just means our goal is a little bit different. And then the second is much more of a logistical um, screening for candidacy. And that's just every dog's mitral valve is different. And some dogs have mitral valves that we know are just not going to have a good outcome when we do the procedure. The device is just not going to function as well in that valve as it would in a different valve. And that's um, unfortunately not something that you would know. That's something that we would screen your dog for on an echocardiogram at an initial screening. And then we would also screen your dog with that preoperative transesophageal echo that I mentioned. And that transesophageal echo, echo really is the gold standard way that we know whether or not the procedure is going to be um, worth pursuing.